Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It dawned on me after last uh, Saturday when we had recorded the service that I had left out what I thought was a fairly important chunk of the sermon. And so I'm going to finish up last week's sermon before going on to this week's sermon. Last week, you'll recall, we were doing Psalm 80. And I talked about how, you know, there was something was wrong and, you know, the people wanted God, strip your power, oh God, come and save us. They wanted something to happen to change things for them. I failed to mention what went wrong. And it was a fairly significant thing. Uh, the Assyrian Empire captured and took over the, what we called the Northern Kingdom Israel, uh, centered in Samaria. And what the Assyrians did, as many ancient conquering nations did, was they uh, moved populations around. And so the people, the northern um, tribes of Israel, let's say, uh, centered again around Samaria, the Assyrians packed these people up and moved them you know, all over their empire. And they brought in other peoples who weren't a part of Israel, uh, they moved them into the land. Samaria was very nice, very great for figs and for vineyards. And so they brought in other people. So fast forward to the year um, 700 years to Jesus, and we have the parable of the Good Samaritan. And now you can see a little bit what the problem is there because the Samaritans really were no longer any part of the people of Israel. Um, for 720 years, other people had moved in and, and the intermarriage and so on and so forth. And so the people are calling on God to you know, stir up your power and come. That you know, the, the crooked may be made straight, that they could return to the way that things were. Well, that brings us 140 years later, and the text for this morning from Isaiah chapter 40, and it's the same thing. Here, the people are speaking from exile, and we will use their own words to sort of understand. Uh, reading from the book of Lamentations, and I'm cleaning this up a little bit because some of it is uh, pretty upsetting, and it's written by someone who was in the city of Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians had it surrounded and were you know, ready to destroy the city as they did. Just a few verses from that. In residence inside Jerusalem, the tongue of the infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives them anything. Those who feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who are brought up in purple cling to ash heaps, for the chastisement of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk, their bodies were more ruddy than coral, their hair like sapphire. Now their visage is blacker than soot, they are not recognized in the streets, their skin has shriveled on their bones, it has become as dry as wood. Happier were those pierced by the sword than those pierced by hunger, whose life drains away, deprived of the produce of the field. And then an observation. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become, that she was great among the nations. She that was a princess among the provinces has become a vassal. And so we have the inside story of what happened when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians attacked, destroyed Jerusalem, uh, destroyed the temple, and they too, like the Assyrians, carried populations away. There is a book by a, a well-known Israeli archaeologist <clears throat> written just a few years ago talking about uh, the, the land, what archaeology shows us about the land uh, after Nebuchadnezzar, and they call it the archaeology of desolation, that indeed there was nothing left, not just in Jerusalem, 
but the surrounding area of what, was, of what once was the kingdom of Judah. The people we know were carried away uh, in captivity, and I want to read a little bit from Psalm 137, uh, written by someone in this foreign land. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willow there we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. So here we have the outside of what happened to Jerusalem, basically 120 years later. So we have the people of Israel, uh, and they're living in captivity by the waters of Babylon. It sounds a little bit like Godspell. We know where they got the words for one of their songs. And the prophet um, has these beautiful words to say to the people. You know, comfort, comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. She has served her term. Her penalty is paid. The prophet is telling the people living in exile, living in Babylon, that, you know, these dark days are over and a new day is coming. And indeed, Cyrus, the Persian king, uh, permits the people of Jerusalem, of Judah, to go back. And apparently, Cyrus even gives them a little seed money so they can start rebuilding the temple. And so the people are able to start heading back. And, you know, we have these words, voice cries out in the wilderness. And what shall I cry? All people are grass, their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The realization that the concern was that when the people of Israel came back, um, when their dark days were over, that the same thing might happen to them again. Talking about how the people just aren't real faithful. Their constancy, you know, just withers like the flower of the field. But the people come back, they start to build the temple, um, and the good days that the prophet talks about and that we anticipate in this Advent season, those days really weren't good for all that long. You know, Alexander the Great comes through, and then things really get bad for the people in Jerusalem and Judah. And then the Roman army comes along. And then, you know, Islam um, rises in 600 AD. And so for the people of Israel, uh, despite Isaiah's words that, that came true when they were able to come back and rebuild Jerusalem, um, and the promise <coughs> the promise of, of God um, that, that's all taken care of, but, but what happens again? As we think about our own lives and in our own lifetimes and think of all the things that have happened to diminish life and to diminish our um, good feelings about life, you know, in Genesis chapter 1, God creates and, God's, and God looks at his creation <coughs> and God says that it's good. As we look around at God's creation now, you know, obviously for many of us, maybe for most of us, things are okay. We wish there wasn't COVID. We wish we could uh, see each other without masks on, that we could shake hands, that we could hug, that we could do that stuff. And as we, again, as we go back in time, we think of all the things, the, the Cold War. Um, I remember the Cleveland newspaper sending out, I think it was a little yellow book on how to build a fallout shelter in your house. And that kind of fear that was always just kind of right, right behind you. Um, and so we realize that life still, let's say, is not perfect. Again, for most of us, life may be pretty good. 
we enjoy uh, the love of family, the fr love of friends, the love of our brothers and sisters here at Zion. And it's pretty good. But we look around and we know that, you know, that's not true maybe from even most of the world. And so with Isaiah and the people of Jerusalem uh, sitting by the rivers of Babylon in captivity, you know, we too wait for God to act. We think in uh, Psalm 80 last week about stir up your power and come, O God, come and save us. And how every Advent that becomes kind of the, the key verse for uh, the living of these days, for the Advent season. I made the comment, and others had agreed that Advent's my favorite time in the church year uh, because it's a time that we celebrate God's promises, uh, God's promises to us. In Isaiah chapter 40, uh, reading on from where I ended, it said, the grass withers, the flower fades. You know, people aren't real faithful. But the word of God will stand forever. And this Advent season, that's what we're celebrating, that God's word lasts forever. And so the promise of God, you know, to all of us, to, to God's creation, you know, we await that time, as I mentioned last week, when uh, the one will come to straighten out the crooked, to lift up valleys, to, to push mountains down, uh, we look forward to that day when God can look at God's creation again and say, this is very good. So this Advent season, as every Advent season, we wait. We celebrate Jesus' birth in just a couple weeks, uh, and it's a, it's a great time for everybody. And then the Christmas season passes, Advent passes, and we're sort of right back into it. Uh, into the, the challenges of being God's people. So we wait. We wait for God to stir up God's power. Um, we wait for God's promises to be kept, for God's promises to be fulfilled for all of us, for our loved ones. And so we wait um, in hope. We wait in faith, knowing that God's word lasts forever. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.